Today I want to take an artifact from digital cameras, something that we usually try to avoid, and turn it up to 11, make it its own aesthetic. And the artifact that I'm hinting at here is rolling shutter. So what is rolling shutter? Well, the old problem here is that modern digital cameras, at least most modern digital cameras, can't read the whole image sensor at once. This is just too much data for their processing. They have to read it line by line like this. And this is usually not a problem, but it is a problem once we start dealing with very fast moving objects. So let's for a moment imagine we have a very fast moving square on our image. And right now, at this point in time, we are processing this single line of our sensor and our square is at this point in space. And now, a very short while later, while we're reading out this line of a sensor right here, our square has traveled in that time. And our square is now at this position right here. So what that means in the end is that if we take a picture of this very fast moving square, we don't actually get a picture of a square. We get a picture of this slanted or skewed square. And this is usually something you want to avoid when taking photos or videos. However, in this case, this is something that I want to turn into an effect. In an empty scene, let's drop down a geo node. Let's dive inside. And first of all, we need an animation to start with. And for this, I want to use a simple RBD sim. So let's start out with a box. Let's bring up the parameters. And first of all, I want to move my box. I want to move my box up a unit of one. And along the Z axis, a unit of three, a distance of three units. So we're at this position right here. And since I later want to deform this box, I want to give it a lot more divisions. So let's turn the axis divisions, let's say to 30. Now let's turn it into a rigid body object using an RBD configure node. And we got lots of parameters to change here. The only thing I want to change in here, however, for this video is just the bounce. Turn on user bounce and turn this up to one to the maximum. Next, let's give it some initial velocity. So let's drop down a point velocity for this. Set the mode to set to value. And what worked nice for me in this case is a Y velocity of five and a Z velocity of minus three. And also I need some angular velocity to make my box rotate. In this case, I just want to randomize this. So drop down attribute randomize node. The attribute that we want to change is called W. And I want to set this to a random value between minus one and one, something like this. Let's check that we have three dimensions because this is a vector and let's make sure this is a point attribute. And finally, since I want to have exactly the same kind of motion as in the previous setup that I built earlier, I'm also going to change the seed under the options to a value of five zero to eight like this. And now this can go into an RBD solver. On that RBD solver, I want to turn this into a slow motion simulation. So let's turn down the time scale to a value of 0.5. And also we need a ground plane. So let's go into the collision tab and set the ground plane to ground plane. And if we now hit play, we get this nice animation right here. And I seem to have forgot one thing on the attribute randomize. I also want to turn the global scale right here up to 10. And now, yeah, this is the motion that I want. And also, let's not forget to turn on the real-time toggle down here. So this is the actual simulation speed. This is the first thing that we need. The next thing that we need is a camera because this is a crucial part of rolling shutter. So let's create a camera. Let's jump out to a VJ level. Let's create a camera node down here. And let's again move it to a very specific place. Let's move it along the x-axis a value of 6, along the y-axis a value of 1.5, and along the z-axis a value of 0.3. And let's also rotate it around the y-axis a value of 90 degrees, like this. And now if we look through our camera and play our animation again, we should see a nice camera angle in here. Now with those things created, it's finally time to jump to our rolling shutter effect. And the first thing that I need for this effect is I need for each point in my box a value if it's right at the top of my camera frame or right at the bottom. And to find that out, we can use one of my favorite tools inside of Houdini, which is the camera coordinate space. So let's do this. First of all, this is still a packed object from RBD sim. So let's unpack it. Let's make it editable geometry again, like this. And now let's drop down a point drop. And again, in here, I want to use the camera coordinate space. Now, 
this has the keyword NDC. And we have these two options. We can move an object from a camera coordinate space to a 3D space or from 3D space to camera coordinate space. And in this case, we want to move our 3D object to camera coordinate space. So let's choose to NDC. Let's make sure on this node that we have the right camera selected, which we have in here. This is just the default Houdini camera path. And let's wear in, first of all, a P attribute into P right here. And let's see what happens if you write that P attribute back out to P as well. A box is gone. Where did it go? Well, it went here and it's quite skewed and stretched and deformed. So what happened here? Well, this gets a lot more clear if we choose as a viewport not the perspective view, but the front view part. Because this right now looks pretty much like a squashed version of a camera view part. And this is exactly what it is. All that this node does is it takes all the points, the positions from a camera's perspective and moves them into this area from x value of 0 to 1 and a y value of 0 to 1. So that means if we want to check if a point is very close to the upper edge or the lower edge of our camera sensor, our camera's view, now within this space, we just have to look at the Y coordinate. So let's do just that. Let's drop down a vec to float to split the vector that is coming out of this node right here. And again, it's the Y value of that vector that we're interested in. So this value right here. And let's simply write this out with a bind export to an attribute, and I want to call this attribute time offset like this. Let's quickly visualize our attribute. Let's jump back out into our scene graph. Let's bring up the info panel and let's click on time offset. And as we can now see, the higher we get to the upper edge of our screen, the higher this value gets, and the lower we get to the edge of our screen, the lower this value gets. And this is exactly what we want. Oh, this is mostly what we want because in this case, I actually want this value to be zero around the middle, not zero right here at the bottom. And also I want this value to be negative right up here and positive right down here to sort of mimic the same effect that we're seeing on the camera sensor. And this is a very simple fix. All we have to do in here is drop down a multiply add constant note. And first of all, to move a zero value to the center, we have to do a pre-add of minus 0.5. And to make the value at the bottom the highest value, not the value at the top, I want to multiply it by minus one, like this. And now a value up here should be a value of minus 0.5 and a value down here should be a value of 0.5. Now we're done here and we actually don't need this visualizer for a P attribute anymore. So let's delete it. Let's keep our box at its original point in space, like this. And now let's keep going with a rolling shutter effect. So the next step that we need to do, and actually the last step for this effect, is to take this time offset value and use it to time shift the animation of each point forwards and backwards in time. And this is actually where this gets a bit complicated, because while we do have a time shift node inside of Houdini, this does not work on a per point level. We can just shift the whole animation forwards and backwards in time, which is not what we want. So we have to find a way to time shift each point by itself by that attribute that we created. And there's a neat little hack that we can use to do this. What I want to do first for this hack is I want to record the entire movement of each point in time along my entire animation inside a polyline. And there are two steps to this. First of all, we need to turn the animation of each point into a polyline. And this is what a trail sop is for. Let's write in our geometry right here. Let's set the mode of the trail sop to connect as polygons. And let's disable close rows. And if we now take a look, a close look at each point, each point is now a line, a line that travels along our animation. And we can change the length of that line to take into account more animation frames like this. So how many animation frames do we need in the end? We need as many frames as we have in our timeline down here. And for my entire animation, I want to set this timeline to 192 frames like this. And to grab this number down here, all I need to write in here on my trail is this little expression called $FND. And now this automatically sets the trail length to this 192 frames like here. Now this is still animated geo, so lines get longer over time, which is not what we want. 
And to fix this, we can actually use a time shift node and simply time shift our entire animation or entire GeoStream to the end of our timeline. So again, in here, I don't want to enter $f into this expression field. I want to enter $f end. And now the entire animation of my box gets turned into these lines right here. And also maybe we can turn off the visualizer that we built earlier. So now I have a piece of geometry that stores the animation of each point. And now I have to build a setup to move each point along this curve. So essentially rebuilding the animation. For this, I'll need another point bob. So let's drop this down. Let's wire our main animation right here into the first input and our animation geometry into the second input. And in here, inside my point bob, I want to build a little setup that looks up a specific position for each point on each curve and then moves that point to that position on that curve. And to look up a position on a curve, since a curve is a primitive inside of Houdini, I can use a prim attribute node in here, which is also called prim uv. So this first of all needs a file to look for, to search from, and this is our output 2, or our input 2, that we write into our bob. We also have to look up the attribute that we want to get from our primitive, so in this case the p attribute. And now we have to find, first of all, the right primitive and then also the right UV coordinate on that primitive. First of all, we need to find the right primitive. And in this case, this is actually quite simple because if we take a look at the info panel, right in here, we have around 5,000 primitives and in here we have around 5,000 points. And crucially, we have the same number of points as we have primitives in here. So each point on a mesh right here corresponds to one line here, one primitive on this geostream. So in the end, to find the right primitive, we simply need to wire our pt num, our point number, into the primitive number down here. Now we have to find the right uv position. And the uv position on a primitive or on a polyline is simply an x value of 0 at this end and an x value of 1 on this end. And the y and z values can all be 0 since we're dealing just with a one-dimensional line in here. So just for starters, I simply want to modify the x value or the u value from my uv coordinate space on that primitive, and I simply want to control this with a slider, which I can create with a parameter. Let's call that parameter anim, and let's wire this into the u component of a prim uv. And I can use either this uv input or those three uvw inputs down here. This does not matter. In this case, this is a bit easier. And then finally, I can take the position that I found using this PremUV node and write it out back to my P attribute. And what I have built now, if I jump back out and I move the slider, is I turned my animation now into a simple parameter that I can just move forwards and backwards in time and therefore control the movement of all of my points. And to turn this back into an actual animation, I can use a simple expression in here. I can say $f, so my current frame, divided by the total number of frames in my timeline, so $f end again. And now if I play through my timeline, I now get the same animation as I did before. Well, it's not exactly the same animation. If I skip from this node to this node, you can see a tiny bit of movement in here, and we can get the exact same result by subtracting one from a $f and $f end, so something like this. And now we have actually the same animation that we started out with. So right now we still did a whole lot of work for nothing, but now we have this single line, this single noodle down here that we can modify and that we can modify on a per point basis to shift our animation forwards and backwards in time. So let's do just that. And of course I want to modify this using my time offset attribute. So let's bring this first of all in with a bind import node. Let's bring in time underscore offset and I want to simply add this to my main animation coming in from here. Let's add both of those together. And if I play now, I have this very time stretched result right here. And this is because right now the time offset is way too strong for a rolling shutter effect. So we have to turn it down a bit. And to turn it down a bit, I simply want to multiply it with another slider. So let's drop down a multiply node. Let's wire this in here. And let's give it some more room in here. Make this a bit more readable like this. And the final slider that I want to create is again a parameter. And let's call that parameter rolling shutter. And let's plug this into a multiply in here. So what I can do now is move to some point in my timeline, maybe this point right here. 
Let's zoom in a bit and let's adjust the rolling shutter slider. And as we can see right now, we can use this to tweak our rolling shutter effect in the end. And what I think works best for this effect is to actually animate the slider. So let's maybe move to some frame at the start, maybe let's say frame 18 and let's set the rolling shutter slider to zero and add a keyframe by simply alt clicking the name of the parameter right here. Then let's move to a different frame, let's say frame 45 and turn up a rolling shutter, maybe to a value of 0.24, add another keyframe and then let's move maybe to frame 73 and again turn this down to zero and add a keyframe. And now if you look through our camera and hit play, we have this really nice interesting trivia effect going on here, which I really like. So this is all I have to tell you for today. This is how to achieve a rolling shutter effect inside of Medini and also a way to tweak time or shift time on a per point basis, which I think is a really, really useful technique for motion design. But until next time, it's cheers and goodbye. And if you like us and want to support us, or just want to learn more about Houdini in End of Courses, consider becoming a patron of ours. And to everyone already supporting us, thank you so much guys. Without you, Entagma would not be possible. With a very special thank you going out to Mohamed Alabri, Umamiya Ichigo, Joseph Harden and David Aiden. Thanks so much guys.